series called March Madness. And what we just saw there was Jesus withstanding a full court press of Satan. At the beginning of that drama, Satan thought he had power. He thought he was going to have victory. He thought he was going to dominate Jesus. But I love it the way that Jesus stood up, embraced his death, and said, I am the victory. Nothing, nothing could deflate me. Nothing could harm me. Nothing could cause me from not going to that very cross. Jesus conquered death. And today we celebrate his life. Today as the body of Christ, today as Christians, we celebrate life. Many of us in our life, we have some very important things that we need to talk about. See, that full court press that Satan tried to do changed some things. It changed our sin. It changed our sin nature. Because of that rebellion, because of that sin, we are all born into a sin nature. But what Jesus did on that resurrection absolutely changed everything. So today I want to talk to you about some great moments, maybe even some hard moments. Have you ever experienced life change? Have you ever experienced something that you will never forget? Have you ever gone through an issue in your life where you thought, that can't get any worse than this? Or maybe it's the opposite of that. Maybe it doesn't get any better than this. Maybe it's the birth of your child, but it could be a divorce that you go through. It could be a death of your child or death of your spouse. And you think, I will never, ever, ever be able to forget this. This moment changes everything. That's exactly what took place on that Resurrection Sunday. It changes everything. There was a man that we're going to talk about today. We're going to read about what his words were. But it changed everything for him. In this drama, they alluded to these men that were in the garden that ran. And it's true. They ran. They were afraid. They scattered. They did not know what was going to take place. And they were afraid that their outcome would be just like Jesus' outcome. And they were afraid. Peter also followed Jesus into the courtyard. And he betrayed Jesus. I don't know the man. Even to a 15-year-old little girl... I don't know the man. He was afraid. He scattered all the way up to the upper room. He scared for three days. But on that moment of the resurrection, Mary and Martha went to the tomb and they saw that Jesus was not there. And they went back and told Peter, James, and John. And they ran to the tomb. And they stooped into that tomb and they saw that tomb was empty. Then, right after then, the man that denied Christ stood up and proclaimed the very message of Jesus. And thousands of people gave their life to Christ. And I want to share with you some scripture found in Acts. We usually go to the Gospels, but in my scripture reading today, we're going to go to the book of Acts. And we're talking about one of the most powerful sermons ever proclaimed outside of what Jesus proclaimed. In Acts chapter 2... Verses 14, if you'd like to turn your Bibles there. I'm going to read out the New Living Translation today. And I think this is so awesome. Then Peter stepped forward with the 11 other apostles and shouted to the crowd, Listen carefully, all of you. Fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem, make no mistake about this. The man that just cowered in fear, the man that was afraid of his own life, the man that cowered in the upper room stood up before the entire crowd and said, I need you to listen to me and I need you to listen to me carefully. Because what I'm about ready to tell you changed my life and it can change your life. Listen to me carefully. And I would like to say that to you as well today. Good Friday, we celebrated the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. The worst day And today may be your Good Friday, 
You may have some issues within your life and you think everything's falling apart and you're saying there is no hope. But I tell you, Friday, but this is Sunday. And Sunday celebrates life. What does it celebrate? I want to tell you a couple things that it does for us. When we talk about what Jesus has done for us, it proves that Jesus is who he said he was. Jesus came as the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He started his earthly ministry three and a half years before his crucifixion. He came as a broken man in a broken world, and he came to die for us. And because he did that, it proves that he is who he said he was. When Jesus first entered into his ministry, it was in the Sea of Galilee, and John the Baptist was baptizing, and, and Jesus came to be baptized. And in front of everybody, the heavens were open, and God said to himself, this is my son whom I'm well pleased. This is my son. This is Jesus, the very son of God. And John the Baptist looked at him and said, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The Lamb of God. And then over three and a half years, he witnessed, he healed, he changed people's lives. In Acts chapter 2, verses 22 through 24, it says this. G Peter was talking here. He says, people of Israel, listen. God publicly endorsed Jesus, the Nazarene, by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him, as well you know. But God knew what would happen. And his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed. When he helped those lawless Gentiles, you nailed him to the cross and you killed him. But God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life for death could not keep him in the grave. Amen. There is no way hell, death, could keep Jesus in the grave. He was the very son of God and he was the redemptive plan of all mankind that because of what Jesus Christ did for us, we have hope. And in that crowd, there were many doubters. In that crowd that Peter stood up in front of all of Israel and Jerusalem and said, I need you to listen to me clearly. The man that you put to death is the very son of God. There's a lot of doubters. The Pharisees were there. The religious leaders that did not want to lose their influence over the crowd, they were there. And they hated the disciples. And they hated Jesus. And then there were some skeptics there. Israel's a very small country. And Jesus walked from top to bottom and he would share the message of his hope. He would heal people. He would feed thousands of people through loaves of bread. Everybody heard this man by the name of Jesus. Everybody heard of him, but not everybody believed in him. It's like our world today. You can't go anywhere without hearing the name of Jesus. But just because we hear the name of Jesus does not mean we have hope in Jesus. We have to have something solid within our life, and that is the hope of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then there were some other people in that crowd those people that followed him, that were fed by him, that were healed by him, but they did not stand beside him. There's some people like that in our country here today. People that have hope in Christ, but do not follow Christ. They may have received him as their Lord, and they may have received his gifts, but when the rubber hits the road, when the hard times come, what they do is they scatter and they hide the resurrection is proof that Jesus being the Son of God and the plan for redemption. The redemption. The Bible says, very simply, we have all sinned. And we've all come short of the very glory of God. None of us, we can't be good enough to go to heaven. Neither are we bad enough to go to hell. The only difference is those that have put their faith and hope in the cross and the salvation of Jesus Christ. Oh, you may not sin badly. You may never do something that's horrible. You may never steal or you may never have an affair. That doesn't mean that you're good enough to go to heaven. There's a lot of good people that go to hell. And the only people 
The only people that go to heaven is what John says, for I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to heaven except through me. Except through the cross. Except for those that have faith in what Jesus Christ has done for me. He was dead, but now he's alive. He was conquering death for you. The chains of doubt and fear and anxiety of relationship failures, that Good Friday, the worst day of his life and the worst day of your life could be changed with faith and hope that Jesus Christ has conquered every one of your fears and he can take care of you every step of the way. Not only he is who he said he was, but he gives hope even in our worst days. Jesus had a very bad day. I like what Acts chapter 2 said. People of Israel, listen. God publicly endorsed Jesus the Nazarene. Listen. He publicly opened the doors. In verse 29 through 32, it says, Dear brothers, think about this. You can be sure that the patriarch David wasn't referring to himself, for he died and was buried, and his tomb is still among us. But he who is a prophet, and he knew God, had promised with an oath that one of David's own descendants would sit on the throne. David was looking into the future and speaking into the Messiah's resurrection. He was saying that God would not leave him among the dead and allow his body to rot. He said he is going to have a resurrection because Jesus went through death. We can have hope into the future. On your worst days, on your fearful days, on the days of your anxieties, we have to remember that this is Sunday. This is life. Satan thought he had won. Satan thought that he had bruised the very mankind and thought that this is his world. He is in control. And we look at our society today and you'd say, I think he is in control. But I need to tell you folks, we are not of this world. We've been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. And until the church stands up and says, I have been redeemed. I know that my redemption is firm. I know that my eternal destination is heaven. We live in a sin-filled world, but we're not of this world. Church, our job is to proclaim what Jesus Christ has done for us. We are his voice piece. We are his lips. We are his hands and we are his feet. And what we must do is in our darkest days, in the biggest fears that we have, we do not have to be afraid of those that have dominion over us because the one that has power in me is greater than he is around me. And Jesus can have victory through my darkest days. I had a friend of mine that... Uh, had a little baby uh, at 26 weeks old, and they're in Wesley Hospital. And uh, they were in sad shape, and uh, they were fearful. So they reached out to me, and uh, I went up to the hospital to see him yesterday. She's in the NICU and at uh, Wesley, and they're, they're scared. Hold the baby in the palm of their hand. The dark day dark day and I was praying with them and they were crying and they were like totally distressed of what could take place and I had the privilege of giving them hope and I said let me pray with you and then I told them a story I told them a story of a young lady and a young man in this church that was on vacation in Colorado and they had a baby at 26 weeks in ICU. And that baby is now a healthy little rug rat that runs around this church. <laughs> and I asked Ashley Jance, I said, Ashley, could you go up to the hospital? Could you give her a text? Could you give her hope? In her darkest days, there's hope. In the darkest days that Ashley and Neil had, they can give hope to somebody that's going through their dark days 
and going through their biggest fears because we do not have to fear death because we know what God can do through us. We don't have to fear our failures because God can use us in our failures. In our darkest days, he gives us hope. And then it requires a life-changing response. We cannot go to the cross without a life-changing exp expression. Even when Pilate stood before Jesus, he washed his hands. He says, I find no fault in this man. But then his weakness, and his cowardness said, I find no fault in him. But do what you will, crucify him. You know, whenever we come face to face to reality, it changes things. And I, I totally believe the word of God to be absolutely true. And I don't have a say in the matter of what it is or what it is not. I am the word of God. I am Jesus' ambassador. My job is not to tell you what my opinions are. My job is not to tell you what I think. My job is not to make you happy. My job is to proclaim the very word of God. And the Bible is very clear, and it says so often that we have to have a life-changing experience. In verse 37, Peter's words pierced their hearts, and they said to him and to other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? We hear the message. We saw what we have done. But now... Jesus is dead, and they are saying he's alive. And now Peter is saying, we put him to death. What should we do? That's a response that we all must have. We all in our life must proclaim that response. What shall we do with what God has done? We can bury our heads in the sand and say this Jesus thing doesn't make sense. It's not true and it's not real and there'll be a lot of agnostics or atheists that would believe that exactly that, that Jesus thing was a hoax. But the Bible is absolute truth. And the Bible is the very word of God. I liked what C.S. Lewis said. Christianity, if false, is of no importance. And if true, if infinite importance, the only thing it cannot be is moderately important. It has to make a decision. We have to make a decision. What does Jesus do with our sins? When we put our faith and our hope and our love in what Christ has done for us, our sins, your sins, my sins are forgiven. The greatest hope that we have is not what we go to when we die, but what we have while we live. Jesus has given us an opportunity to share the message of Jesus Christ and not live in condemnation, in fear, in exile. He gives us hope. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it says this, and if there is any resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if you hope in Christ, only if you live, we are more than pitied than anyone in the world. But in fact, Christ has raised from the dead. He is the first of the greatest harvest of what we have died. So you see, just as death came into this world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. Just as everyone dies because we are alone with Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. Everyone that has been given to Christ will have new life. Well, let's land the plane. What does that mean? I have a responsibility in front of you today. 
Just as Peter stood up in front of Jerusalem and of all of Israel and said, listen to what I have to say. And you may have been in church many years, or maybe this is one of your first times that you're in church. I want to share with you. I have to share with you. I am mandated by God to share with you. It's not about being good. It's not about being bad. It's about having your hope and your faith in Christ. So I want to share a couple of things with you. Believe that Jesus is who he said he was. I have to believe that Jesus Christ was the very son of God. I believe that Jesus Christ came to this earth for one purpose, and that is to die. And when he died, he shed his blood. The perfect lamb of God shed his blood to cover our sins. We cannot get to heaven without going through the cross. And I have to believe that Jesus is who he said he was. In Romans chapter 10, verse 9. If you openly declare that Jesus is the Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be, what? Saved. Saved from what? Saved from the penalty of sin. Saved from the damnation of hell. You shall be saved. You must be saved. And the second thing is personally receive the hope he gives. I have to personally receive. Not I hope it happened. Not that's good for my mom, or that's good for my dad, or that's good for my kids. I have to personally receive. Just because I'm a preacher doesn't my, mean my kids are going to heaven. Everybody has to make that decision for themselves. I have to personally receive the faith that Jesus Christ has given to me and have hope of my salvation. Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God. We must repent of our sins and return to God. Personally receive him and his hope. And become a person I was created to become. God has gifted us. And God has given to us hope. We can be the person that God was created us to be. In John chapter 1 verse 12. But to all who believe him and accept him. He gave the right to become the children of God. Now, we had two actors up here, Justin and Justin. And now, everybody, Justin and Justin, I say Justin and Justin. Yeah. Is, is that James? James. Yeah. Ju Justin and Justin, what kind of thing is that? Anyway, James and Justin. James was Satan, so I, I didn't want to talk about James. But everybody hates James now, right? Because how dare you hit Justin? I mean, <laughs> Just is the most godly person in our church. And if you hit Justin, you must really be in trouble. But the significance of that is perfect. Justin said, I love the children of God. That's what Jesus is saying about us. He loves us. He came to this earth to die. That sounds so weird. Why would somebody die for you? Or die for me. Because in Genesis chapter 2, sin entered into this world. Adam and Eve sinned. And because of their sin, there was a breakage of, of relationship between God and man. And for years, thousands of years, that sin overshadowed this world. In the foreknowledge of time of God, he said, this is the time. Today is the day that I'm going to send my only begotten son into this world. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We are broken. You're broken and I'm broken. I can't get to heaven on my own. And neither can you. But there's a point in our life where this cross of shame, humility, and agony comes to the crux of our life. Do you look at this cross and fear? Or do you look at the cross and worship? Jesus did not die 
because of the Romans. Jesus did not die because of Pilate. Jesus died because of you. You put him on that cross. And I put him on that cross. Because sin is in the world. And Jesus came to reconcile your sin and mine to God. His last words hanging on this cross was, It is finished. It is finished. God, your children now have an access. They have an avenue, a conduit from this world to you because of that cross. My question to you, as I told you, I have to ask this question. I am mandated by God as the preacher to proclaim this message to you. I have not done my job if I do not proclaim and stand up like Peter did and said, listen to what I have to say carefully. Every one of us, as a believer in Jesus Christ, has gone through the cross, has gone through the blood. But not everybody has done that. Everyone needs to do it. Everybody should do it. But doesn't mean everybody does do it. But I do not want anybody, I want to say this with all due respect, I don't want anybody to stand before God and say, I remember in 2018, I went to that Easter service in that church in South Wichita. And I heard that gray-haired, fat old man stand up and proclaim the message of Jesus. And I said, not for me. Not for me. Because that message is for you. And every person, the Bible says, their knee will bow and their tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Let me tell you what that means. It's either you will confess Jesus is Lord while you're alive today or one day when you stand before God and you remember this message and you remember what the Lord has taught you and you stand before God, you will confess him as Lord, whether it's for salvation or after condemnation. But you will believe that Jesus was the Lord and Savior. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. Peter stood up in Acts chapter 2 and he said, Folks, I need you to listen. I want to share it a different way. Folks, I need you to be very self-aware. Your eternity is in the balance. I need you to be very self-aware of what Jesus Christ has done for you. And all we have to do is accept what Jesus Christ wants to do through you. And that's to give to you hope, help, and forgiveness. And an ultimate destination into heaven. I want to say a prayer. I don't want to embarrass anybody. Although Jesus stood on this cross publicly humiliated for you. I want to make this very simple for you. If you've never given your life to Christ, if you've never gone through the experience of salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ, I want to say a prayer. And if you need salvation, if you need his hope, if you need his forgiveness, if this is your life and it's Good Friday, it's the worst day of your life and you need Jesus to be your Savior and you believe that he died on the cross and he rose again, you may not know everything about the Bible and you may not know anything about God, but you know that you are lost and you know there's no hope. If you would, please repeat this prayer in your heart as I say it out loud. Dear Heavenly Father, I need you. I am broken. I am lost. I am in my sin. And Lord, I am miserable. But Lord, I know what you've done for me. I know that you died on that cross and you shed your blood and you had victory over that death. On that third day, you arose. Lord, I need you to do something for me. 
I need you to come into my heart. Lord, I need you to forgive me of my sins. Lord, I need restoration. I need reconciliation. Lord, I need your forgiveness. Give to me the hope that only you can give. The healing that I cannot do on my own. Lord, allow me to have the hope of Jesus Christ within my life. I give to you my heart, my life. Come into my heart. Give me hope and give me peace. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. If you have said that prayer and you believe what this day is all about, that Jesus died on that cross. Before he died on the cross, he shed his blood. And the blood that Jesus Christ shed cleanses. Say that word with me, cleanses. Say that word, cleanses. Your sins were scarlet, but now they are white as snow. What does that mean? That means we look at our sin-filled life and we see our failures. But because of the cross, when Jesus looks at you, he does not see the sin in your life. He sees the blood of his son that was shed for you. You are in now no condemnation. Now, because of your faith in him, you have been reconciled back to God. We call it in church and ease, you are saved. Saved from yourself. Saved from your sin. Saved from eternal damnation. And you're reconciled to God. If you've made that prayer. If you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross. And you've accepted him as your Lord and Savior. Well done. Well done. Because your eternal destination is secure. Your hope is is secure. Now I want to ask you to do one more thing. I'm not going to ask you to come forward in front of hundreds of people. What I am going to ask you to do is the card that's in front of you. I believe salvation is the very first step. But after that, you're saying, okay, I believe that Jesus died for me. But what does that do for me? I believe the next step is discipleship. Learn. Get into a church and learn what God wants to do with you and through you and for you. Don't just get saved and walk out the door and see you next Easter. Get saved and change your life and do what God wants you to do. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. As we celebrate the death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, changed our life. It's very important to live our life for him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we do thank you. We thank you for what you've done for us. And Lord, I pray that those that made that prayer for the very first time in their life, I pray that you'll work within their hearts and their lives and change who they are and love them and to give them hope. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.